Dr. John Lott, who's, Lott, who's uh, appearing by remotely <coughs> from somewhere. And uh, he's yeah. Crime Prevention Research Group, Mr. Dr. Lott. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I greatly appreciate the chance to address the uh, chair, Senator Sears, and the other members of the committee. Uh, I'm from Montana right now, Missoula, Montana. Just to give you a little bit of my background, I was recently senior advisor for research and statistics in the U.S. Department of Justice. I was previously uh, uh, chief economist for the United States Sentencing Commission, and I've had research and teaching positions at the Wharton Business School, Stanford, uh, Yale, uh, University of Chicago, and Rice and UCLA. Uh, oh, mate, uh, I'm here to talk about uh, Senate Bill 209. Uh, homemade guns have existed in Vermont and the rest of the country since even before the United States became a country. Uh, and it's already a federal crime for somebody to transfer a homemade firearm. The recent push for serial numbers on all parts of guns relies on claims that it protects public safety and prevents violent crime. Uh, the current Solicitor General, Elizabeth uh, uh, Prelogar, uh, wrote in a 2023 court filing, quote, the public safety interests in reversing the flow of ghost guns to dangerous and otherwise prohibited people uh, easily outweighs the minor costs that respondents will incur. Uh, similarly, uh, U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland claimed in uh, 2022 it will help ensure that law enforcement officers can retrieve the information they need to solve crimes, and it will help reduce the number of untraceable firearms flooding our communities. The expanded use of serial numbers aims at stopping the production of homemade guns, now called ghost guns. Uh, while homemade guns have been around since the United States became a country and before that, it's never been terribly difficult to make a gun with simple machine tools. Their production has become uh, nearly impossible to regulate, however, with the advent of 3D printers. People can just make indistinguishable weapons from those purchased in stores. But it, uh, even if homemade guns had serial numbers, they, won't, they don't help solve uh, crimes in the way that you see on TV shows like Law & Order. Uh, in theory, if criminals leave registered guns to the crime scene, law enforcement can use serial numbers to trace the weapons back to the perpetrators. But in real life, guns are only left at a scene of a crime when a gunman has been seriously injured or killed, with both the criminal and weapon present at the scene. Uh, you know, in, in a few cases, uh, when the guns left at the scene and the criminals aren't there, uh, they're usually not registered. And in the, and in the couple of cases where they are registered, they're not registered to the person who committed the crime. Police in Hawaii, Illinois, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and New York have had registration systems in place for decades, but can't point to any crimes uh, that this has helped solve. Uh, even entire countries such as Canada haven't had success. In a 2001 lawsuit, the Pennsylvania State Police could not identify any crime solved by their registration system between 1901 and 2001. However, they did claim that it had, quote, unquote, assisted in four cases for which they could not provide details. In a 2013 deposition for District Columbia v. Heller II, the plaintiffs recorded that the Washington, D.C. police chief could not, quote, recall any specific instances where registration records were used to determine who committed a crime except for possession offenses, end quote. During testimony before the Hawaii State Senate in 2000, Honolulu's police chief said that he could not identify any crimes since 1960 uh, when registration and licensing were started that were able to solve crimes. The police chief also said that his officers devoted about 50,000 hours their time each year to register and licensing guns yearly. Police time that could have been spent on traditional time testing law enforcement activities. I could go through similar records that exist for Canada. 
New York and Maryland spent tens of millions of dollars compiling computer database containing the unique ballistic fingerprints, serial numbers, and names of gun owners for each new gun sold uh, in those states over 15 year periods of time. Even these states, which strongly favor gun control, eventually abolished their systems because they could not point to one single crime that it had solved. Despite predictions by gun control advocates that this program would be important crime fighting tools, New York scrapped its program in 2012. In 2015, Maryland followed suit. Maryland spent $5 million just on the computerization of its of the database that was there. Uh, New York spent a total of over $45 million on their project. And it was pretty clear from the beginning that these weren't working out uh, well before the 15 years was up. And a 2005 report by the Maryland uh, State Police Forensics Sciences Division labeled the operation, quote, ineffective and expensive. You know, I could go on, but the bottom line is that these policies haven't produced any crime uh, reducing benefits. Uh, and I think the main reason why they're pushed is that uh, when you have serialization, it's eventually possible to go and uh, uh, confiscate guns. But I'm um, happy to take any questions uh, from from you, and I appreciate your time. Excuse me, Senator Baruch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lott. So, if I'm understanding your argument, you're you're saying that serialization is expensive and ineffective, as you said. Um, so if we stipulate that, uh, there is another, uh, what I think important piece of this, which is that if a, a, a ghost gun is taken in to have a serial number put on it, it there's also a background check run. Um, so that's another arm of this, is to try to um, bring the background check system uh, into focus for these weapons. Do you have an argument uh, about that, because I, I don't think you've mentioned it. Right, no, I, I, I did not address that, that's correct. The, the issue, I guess, would be if the individual has a ghost gun to begin with, uh, and you won't know whether he has a ghost gun or not, uh, you know, is he the type of person then that you're gonna be able to use to trace the gun back to him if he uses it in a crime? And I think that is relevant to what I've been saying beforehand. I mean, I suppose if the police are at the person's home and they find that he has the gun or they, you know, he's carrying the gun around and they go and they examine the gun to see whether or not it has a serial number and it doesn't have one at that point, uh, then uh, they could arrest him for possession of a gun. Uh, I think that those are relatively low probability events, but, uh, you know, it's still possible, as you say, that that could be the case. Um, but in terms of actually solving crimes, I, I think the arguments that I was making still apply to those. So, and and I, I hear what you're saying. Solving crimes is definitely one thing. The other thing is trying to prevent guns from being in the hands of people that shouldn't have them. And so the whole background system is designed to do that. If we have people printing guns in, in their family room, um, Obviously, it's a complete evasion of that system. So this bill has a, a piece of it that brings that system to bear, understanding what you're saying, that it might be a relatively low probability event that you could stop that person or catch that person committing a crime, but you could certainly catch them with a background system if for other reasons they're not supposed to have a weapon. Uh, but they're not gonna... Right, I understand. I guess the question is, if it's somebody who's planning on using the gun in the crime, and obviously they don't, or they have a criminal record and they're not gonna go through the background check, how are you gonna find that they have the gun at home? Are you gonna well, go? This is the argument that we have over every piece of gun safety legislation, which is that criminals won't abide by it, law-abiding people will, therefore you'll never catch the criminals. But obviously people who put forward the gun safety legislation believe that what we're doing is 
eventually creating a more law-abiding culture where people abide by the background checks. Even most gun owners say should not have guns. So that was my that was my question. I appreciate your answers, and I'll turn it over to to the others. Senator Bonowski, Senator Sears. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you can explain the peer review process that you use for your um, data and and how what process that goes through before it's put out to us or brought to us. Sure. <clears throat> Well, I mean, I talk about uh, these issues of licensing and registration in my book, More Guns, Less Crime, which was published by the University of Chicago Press. I uh, went through three editions, 1998, 2000, and 2010. Uh, in each of those editions, the University of Chicago Press uh, sent the book out uh, for peer review, uh, anonymous peer review from other academics. Uh, in the third edition, I know they sent it out to six different uh, academics uh, to go and do a review of the book uh, and uh, we had to go through the, the process where I responded to their comments they sent it back to the referees the referees agreed that I had dealt with their concerns and then the book was published so that's kind of the normal way that uh, that peer review works on these things um, and so that was more than 20 years ago do you have current academic research in academic publications? Yeah, of course I do. But I'm just saying, I'm giving an example. My book was published, it's not 20 years ago, it was 2010, was the third edition of the book. Okay. Uh, and uh, 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 the examples that I've just gone through in terms of licensing and registration, uh, you know, whether it be, uh, you know, uh, Hawaii or uh, Pennsylvania or uh, some of these other states are more recent. But yeah, no, I've, I've published over 120 articles in peer-reviewed journals. Uh, and as I say, I've had academic positions at a wide range of universities. And of course, uh, more recently, uh, as of uh, 2020 and 2021, I was working in the Department of Justice as senior advisor for uh, research and statistics in both the Office of Justice Programs and then the Office of Legal Policy. Okay, great, thank you. My other question was, so you draw a correlation between the laws in Canada and the lack of evidence for serialization solving crimes, but do you agree that empirically Canada has stricter gun regulations and a significantly lower rate of violence in gun crime? They had even lower crime rates before they had their gun control laws. So yes, they do have lower crime rates, at least in terms of murder than the United States, though in terms of other violent crime rates, Canada does have a higher, higher, uh, you know, if you add uh, rapes, aggravated assaults and robberies, Canada has higher rates of those violent crimes than the United States does, and they had those to begin with. But if you look over time, uh, Canada's violent crime rate as a whole went up after uh, after they passed their gun control laws, including. But that their, is a correlation. That is not causation. No, but you, well, look, uh, there are very few academics that make purely cross-sectional comparisons. Uh, what you want to try to do is to look over time to see how crime rates change before and after they have their gun control laws, because there are many other things that can change. And you don't want to look at one place. Uh, one of the reasons why most of the world uses U.S. data when they're looking at things is that we have 51 different laboratories. Uh, and so hopefully you have enough different states change their laws in enough different years that you can begin to disentangle all the different factors that are there. You can't have more tests. Uh, you, can't have, you can't account for more factors than you have tests that you're going to be looking at. But, you know, if you look at my book, More Guns, Less Crime, for example, uh, I look at many different, I look at like five different qualitative tests. And while it's possible that somebody may come up with uh, an explanation for one of the tests that are there, you know, that some factor was left out, as you have more and more different types of evidence, it becomes more and more difficult 
to try to figure out what other factor might be explaining the changes that you're looking at there. The vast majority of academic papers only look at one test that's there. But it's one of the reasons why I look at five different types of tests. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, sure. The first, I want to describe where I live. I live in the southwest corner of Vermont, very close to Albany, New York. Um, for some reason, the southwest corner of Vermont has seen an increase in police uh, recovering so-called ghost guns, um, much more so than anywhere else in the state. As a matter of fact, uh -huh. not one of the 15 counties are the two highest. And it's inexplicable to me why we would be there. So I was kind of speculating, well, maybe our licensed firearm dealers are better doing a better job of stopping straw purchases of firearms, which is forcing the drug cartel, I use that term for real, I mean, they're in business um, right. to sell this year. So my speculation is that maybe the RFSLs are doing a better job than other parts of the state, which is forcing the straw purchases to go away. Is there any basis on that? Well, I don't know how uh, the drug problem compares across different places in, uh, in Vermont. I guess my research and training over the years seemed to indicate to me how very difficult it is to go and stop drug gangs from getting a hold of weapons. Uh, if you stop them in one way, they'll go and find some other way to go and obtain it. Uh, you know, drug gangs have very valuable property that's there. Uh, and, you know, it's not like they can go and contact the police to go and say, you know, I, somebody stole our drugs, this other gang stole our drugs, can you help us get them back? They have to essentially set up their own little militaries in order to protect that very valuable property. And you look, you know, if I could click my fingers and cause all guns in the United States to disappear and all illegal drugs, you know, how quickly would illegal drugs start coming back into the United States? My guess is if you live in El Paso, 20 minutes, and how long would it be before they bring in weapons uh, to protect that valuable property? I assume they'd be bringing it at the same time. I mean, you can look at a country like Mexico, for example, uh, which has had only one gun store in the country since 1972, uh, run by the military. The most powerful gun that you can legally buy in Mexico is a 22 caliber short round bolt action rifle. That's not the type of gun uh, that drug gangs use down there. Uh, Mexico, even though you, ha you have less than one tenth of 1% 1 of the adult population that's legally licensed to own a gun in Mexico, and yet Mexico's murder rates more than doubled since 1972. And in many recent years, Mexico's murder rate's been as high as six times higher than the murder rate that we have here in the United States. And it's not because of ghost guns or anything else that they have there. It's just that they bring in weapons from around the world, literally, uh, just as they bring in the drugs from around the world that they then export to the United States. So, you know, I wish it was a simple problem to go and stop drug gangs from going and getting a hold of illegal guns. But, uh, you know, if you want to go and explain kind of the behavior of drug gangs over time and the amount of violence that they do. It's basically related to changing profitability for selling drugs. As profitability uh, increases at certain points of time, you're going to see more drug gang violence and more efforts to go and get uh, weapons uh, because more is at stake. And so drug gangs will fight against each other, for example, in order to try to control uh, drug turf. Um, so you know, it's, you know, it's a difficult problem. Uh, you know, it's, you have to figure out ways to take out the profitability uh, for drug gangs there if you're ultimately going to stop them from a, obtaining weapons in one way or another. Thank you. Senator Norris and Senator Sheehan and then Senator Bowski, and then we take a break. All right. I'm all for a break. Thank you, Dr. Locke, for being here.
Uh, a couple of things, and maybe I missed it. We we're uh, comparing Canada to the United States, so on and so forth. And I don't know if it was if the question was posed in a way of per capita basis, whatever else. But Canada is obviously just shy of 40 million people, and the United States is uh, just shy of 340 million people. So I guess that would make sense that we have more crime in the United States for, based on the population, unless we're looking at it on a per capita basis. But anyways, in reference yeah. to uh, serialized firearms, so what I'm hearing is. And I have a second part of this question, I might So what I'm hearing is the serialization of guns is doesn't prevent crime. The only crime that is incurred upon police responding to this is either a defaced serial number or a, or a firearm that doesn't have a serial number on it. Is, is that correct? That's right. Yeah, just to answer your first point also, uh, yeah, all the discussion that we were having before is on per capita rates of crime. Thank you. And, that's my, and my last question would be because I don't know the answer to this. Uh, I know the kits that are put together and, and mailed out, whatever, or one thing. The 3D uh, figurations of, of people putting guns together in their house or whatever else, are those particular guns, do, do they have rifling in them? Oh, yeah, sure they can. I mean, you can make you can make a 3D metal printed gun that is functionally and cosmetically identical uh, to any gun that you can go and buy in a store. So crime is more apt to be solved by ballistics through rifling from a firearm than it is from non-serialization of the firearm. Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously that's what the FBI does, obviously. Uh, what you do is, uh, if you have the bullet at the crime scene, uh, you're not going to have the gun, uh, as you point out. You may arrest the person at some later date for some other type of crime, and if you have confiscate the gun at that time, hopefully you can begin to, uh, uh, you know, link bullets that you have in your inventory uh, there uh, with the gun uh, that you may confiscate at the crime scene or from the criminal. Thank you. Senator Sheen, you? Thanks. Uh, yeah, I guess just a general comment. Um, I, mean, I don't know what's happening in these other police departments where the serial numbers are never being used uh, to resolve crime. I mean, I'm thinking back to 2018, literally one of the final arrests that I ever made was a seizure of a little under, I believe, 10 grand worth of stolen firearms. Serial numbers were essential in resolving that crime. So, and I'm, I'm sure plenty of my former colleagues have also used serial numbers in resolving crime. I mean, I'm not going to speak for them, but I'm just speaking on my own experience of um, from about five years ago. That's all. Awesome, thanks. Um, my question, I just wanted to clarify. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Senator Seems, Senator Seems, a former state trooper in Vermont. Yes, no, I, I'm familiar with the senator. I appreciate his comment. Well, you know, the question is, what crime are you solving? If the person uses a gun in a crime, you know, and again, we we separate out the ballistic issues that uh, Senator Norris was bringing up beforehand. Uh, you know, so I catch the criminal, he has drugs on him, let's say, and he has a gun that he's used in some previous crime. The, the serial number is not going to link you to that crime that the person had committed with the gun. I don't know how it does that. Now, maybe the serial number, you can go then and trace it to see uh, who sold the gun originally to them. But that's different than solving uh, a crime that's there. And you know, what you generally find, even in tracing it back to the original dealer that's there, uh, is is not going to, you know, the person probably sold the gun originally legally. So uh, you have a real problem there. It's the serial number is not going to help you solve a crime that the person committed at another point in time with the gun. I disagree. Uh, I saw. Well, I, I just logically tell me exactly how. Okay, I, so I pick up a guy, you know, I, I pulled him over for a traffic stop. He has a gun, it has a serial number on it. And, I, you know, three months earlier, he shot somebody with the gun. Other than looking at ballistics, how does the serial number there help you solve that earlier crime? I don't understand your question. Well, I, I'm just saying. 
give me a concrete explanation for how the serial number actually helps you solve earlier crimes that the person committed with the gun. Sure. You so, didn't leave the gun at the crime so, scene. You don't I'm know that that gun question. was used at the crime scene. Me. You go ahead and finish your statement, but I'm done. So thank you. Well, I, I was finished. Yeah, so I'll finish. Come on. The gun that was, that was found in possession of somebody who stole it from somebody else is traced back to the serial number. It's proves that the, if the other person reported that gun stolen and had a serial number, wouldn't that solve the crime? Eight it's not necessarily ballistic. Right. Where it's, illegal we possession of the gun. gun was used. We don't know if the gun was used in a commission of a shooting, but we know right. that the gun was stolen. So the serial yeah. number proves the gun was stolen because the person reported, let's say the FSL reported these 10 firearms were stolen. These are the serial numbers. Senator Hashim, as Trooper Hashim, <clears throat> finds the 10 firearms, the serial numbers match, proves that this guy stole them. Right. And as I, when I went through the things, I said possession was the one type of crime that they had been able to solve. Uh, and those were, you know, even those were a small number of cases, but uh, for a couple of the places, there were possession uh, type crimes, which is what you're referring to there, that were able to be solved. But there's two different categories. There's actually use of the gun in a crime, and that's, that's like never successful in solving those. And then possession uh, through theft, but that those it can, but even those are rare. But I, I, I still don't. I'm going to get into a real problem here by saying something that I probably shouldn't say, but I still don't understand why people are opposing this bill. <laughs> I think this is the simplest bill I've ever introduced in terms of anything to do with firearms, much simpler than red flag laws and others. And I, I know I get in trouble for that, but good Lord. If I can print this, if I can print up a firearm and nobody can trace the serial number, it makes it much more difficult. I, so I don't understand what the problem is. But anyway, Senator Wachowski. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify because I my brain was processing all the information earlier. Was your testimony that rates are higher in Canada than in the United States? Homicide rates are lower, much lower in Canada, but overall violent crime rates are higher in Canada. If you look at the International Crime Victimization Survey, the overall violent crime rate in Canada is about 50% higher than the overall violent crime rate in the United States. So that's going to be rape, robbery, and aggravated assaults. Because I'm looking at international data that shows that the rape rate in Canada is in fact 23 times lower than in the United States. So I just, I'm, I guess we're back to our data issue that the data seems to be kind of all, all over the place. It's, so thank you for clarifying that for me. Okay, are there any well, other? Uh, I'm done. You're done. Yes. You're done. You're done. I'm done. Dr. Lott, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, you're in Montana today. Right. Is that correct? Well, yes, correct, sir. Well, thank you for joining us early, though. All right. I've... There's a time, time difference in Montana, and hopefully you get to see the sun. We haven't seen the sun in eight, uh, eight okay. days. Here. Come on. So well, hopefully uh... you get to see the sun today. Yeah, it's supposed to be up into the 50s today and uh, and clear. So, uh, but anyway, I greatly appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor. Bye now. So we're going to take.